Welcome all to the Center for Global Development. This is our first online event of the coronavirus lockdown. And the title is Financing the Global Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm an ex the Executive Vice President and a Senior Fellow here at the Center for Global Development. I'd like to ask you before I make the introductory comments to please ask questions as we go along. The way to do that is to send us a message on Twitter at CGDEV, hashtag CGD Talks. You can add a comment under the YouTube feed, or you can email us at events at CGDEV.org. So what will we talk about today? The COVID-19 pandemic is a health and economic crisis that is making itself felt worldwide. The U.S. is now the coronavirus epicenter with the most confirmed new cases in the world, and Italy reports the most deaths. We are among the highest income countries in the world, and today, my community hospital called for homemade masks to be donated. But unfortunately, we know that this outbreak does not stop in our own countries, that this is just the beginning of the global outbreak and its health and economic effects. Our panel today is going to look at the COVID-19 impact and needs of developing and emerging market countries, acknowledging that this is a hard time to talk about other countries' needs. But we must, because our economies and well-being are entirely interconnected and cannot be decoupled, because high-income countries won't be done with this outbreak until all countries are done with this outbreak, and because we've already partnered and invested so successfully to drive down child deaths and preventable disease around the world. The scale of the impact of COVID is hard to grasp, but one way to look at it is a way that a colleague has done. Looking at declines in GDP growth projected for East Asia, for example, this economic downturn may result in up to 200,000 additional infant deaths in developing countries, even without any COVID-19 deaths. So it is not either health or the economy, it is both health and the economy. So what do we need? Let me now turn to our panelists. We're going to start with Brad Setzer. He's a senior fellow in international economics at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's going to give us the macro view, what's happening and what's needed. Thanks, Brad. Uh, thank you. You know, I'm not gonna focus on the, the health consequences of COVID-19, they're obviously enormous. Rather, I'm gonna focus on the financial shock, which is also one of unprecedented size and scope. What makes it particularly complicated is that there isn't just one financial shock hitting the global economy, but rather a broad set of financial shocks, each of which on its own would warrant and require an almost unprecedented international response. The most obvious shock is the one that has taken place in commodity markets, and particularly the oil market. Uh, oil prices are now below 25 for most grades of crude, significantly below that for uh, many. The break-even oil price for many oil exporters to cover their balance of payments was around $50. So it's easy to forecast large shortfalls in export proceeds across those emerging economies and low-income countries that depend on commodity export revenue. The stronger oil exporters, the Saudis, the GCC countries, the Norways, the Russias, can manage through their accumulated reserves. But many countries will not be able to offset this fall in export income and will have a need for current account financing. The second shock is a broad shock to trade, all forms of trade, manufacturing trade, which will shrink in both directions as the US, EU, and others slow their economies in a necessary effort to slow the spread of the virus. It is hard to forecast precisely which countries will see bigger falls in exports than in imports, but it is another potential source of shock and certainly will weigh on economic activity. Third, don't forget tourism, which clearly is going to go to zero or close to it 
And that is an important source of export proceeds for a subset of emerging economies and low-income countries. Fourth, long-run portfolio flows, the kind of long-term bond financing that helps countries cover budget deficits and fill balance of payments gaps, has also shrunk dramatically. The IIF, the Institute for International Finance, is forecasting, or based on the data that they are tracking, a sharper contraction in these flows than experienced during the global financial crisis. And then finally, the short-term dollar borrowing market, call it the dollar funding market, which many financial institutions around the world use to raise money, raise money for trade finance, raise money to help they meet the hedging needs in their economies. That funding market is under strain in many countries and financial institutions that rely on steady access to this market have faced difficulty. Because there are multiple shocks, and because those shocks are different, and because the funding needs that arise from the shocks differ, in my view, there needs to be a differentiated response with different institutions each mobilizing their full capacity to address this unprecedented problem. The basic principle here, in my view, needs to be that as private financing and as private trade contracts, official financing needs to expand in the same way that the Fed is expanding its balance sheet here at home and the ECB is expanding its balance sheet. The first wave of response has come from the Federal Reserve, which has taken a, a set of important actions to address dollar funding needs amongst financial institutions globally, not just in the United States. The Fed has reactivated the swap lines that were used in the global financial crisis and made those swap lines available to all the countries that received swap lines uh, back in 2008 and 2009. It also has created a new repo facility for central banks, which have large holdings of treasuries. Those countries have reserves, but those reserves typically are held in medium-term treasuries. And by letting those countries borrow against those treasuries, the Fed is helping those countries provide financing to their financial institutions, but also making sure that those countries don't need to sell treasuries and thus add to stress in the treasury market. These actions are clearly in the United States' own interest, as well as the interest of the global economy. But the Fed can only realistically cover short-term funding needs arising from financial institutions. That is the Fed's role. I'm glad the Fed is acting. I think the Fed can do perhaps more to support dollar-based trade financing, but the Fed has led this response, and now it is time for other institutions to step up. The IMF is the obvious source for balance of payments finance. The IMF has lent out roughly to and committed to lend out roughly a third of its 600 billion in committed quota resources. It currently has access to another 225 to 250 billion through the new arrangement to borrow and a backup set of bilateral financing lines of close to 400 billion. The new arrangement to borrow is scheduled to increase to 450 to 500 billion at the end of this year. I would encourage the IMF to do everything it can to get the support from its members and the legislative consents required to pull that forward. The US has already got the necessary approvals as part of the legislative response to the crisis. The bilateral lines are scheduled to fall from over 400 billion to less than 200 billion as the new arrangement to borrow expands. I would encourage the IMF to try to get support from its members to maintain that bilateral, those bilateral lines at their current level. If those steps are taken, the IMF would have new lending capacity of close to a trillion dollars over the next year and a half. That can play a very important role in helping to address this shock. I also think the IMF should embrace those calls to provide the world with more reserves through an SDR allocation of close to 500 billion. 
everybody needs more reserves now and an SDR allocation, which gives countries reserves, is an appropriate response to a common shock. It also incidentally, in my view, helps the United States. We are not a country that has large reserves and the treasury has been very creative in using the exchange stabilization fund, which is the US's existing pool of reserves to backstop domestic financial institutions that play global roles like money market funds. We would benefit too. I don't know as much about the World Bank. Other members of the panel, I think, will discuss in more detail how the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks can expand their lending. And I fully support efforts to mobilize their full capacity and expand it. This is a time which calls for an unprecedented mobilization of financing. Finally, the World Bank and the IMF has, have appropriately called on bilateral creditors, government to government creditors, China, the US, others, to reschedule all claims coming due this year so that bilateral lenders are not taking money out of low income and emerging economies at a time when these countries need support. I think that's a very important step that can help magnify the impact of the resources that will come in. I also think there will be a need on the part of some countries to reschedule long-term bonds that are coming due to private creditors. That has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis and the arguments will differ. But in general, the same principle that so calls for bilateral creditors to defer taking money out also applies to long-term bond lenders. I'm sure they won't necessarily like that, but it is a better outcome than a wave of defaults. The good news here is that between the Fed, the IMF, a bold response from the multilateral development banks, the deferral of bilateral claims and similar actions, the world can in fact mobilize sufficient financial resources so that finance doesn't become a constraint that hurts public health. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. And we'll come back to this issue of debt rescheduling and relief in, in the question and answer section. Um, now let's go to Masood Ahmed, who will talk about what is that scale of the ask? What can we expect to see from the IMF and the World Bank? Thanks. Thank you very much, Amanda. So I want to start off by picking up on a point that Brad made, which is that this really is an unprecedented shock. It's going to be much larger for developing countries than the global financial crisis was, because in addition to all the shocks that he talked about, which were mostly related to how countries interact with the world economy, there is a domestic supply shock in these countries, which comes from the epidemic itself. And that means that they themselves are going to have to cope with that additional supply side problems that that's going to create. And so what are going to be the financing needs? And it's a little uncertain right now, but the IMF has already come out with a preliminary estimate that the financing needs for developing countries and emerging markets are going to be about two and a half trillion dollars. Uh, that sounds a lot, but two and a half trillion is, uh, is less than what we are spending in, in the United States alone. So, uh, so we, that two and a half trillion dollars, the big difference for those countries compared to the rich countries is that they cannot finance this from their own resources because they have neither the ability to print money that, nor do they have the uh, capacity to be able to borrow from commercial markets. And they have some reserves they're going to have to use those reserves, the countries that have them. But for the others, and that's the large majority of these countries, the bulk of their financing is going to have to come from the international financial institutions. Brad talked about the IMF and the role it can play. Uh, for the World Bank and the MDBs, 
others are going to talk in detail in the, in the panel, but they also can step up their financing by about 50 billion, uh, uh, by about sorry, 500 billion dollars uh, altogether, which is the capacity that they have to be able to provide surge financing. The key is how to get this financing out quickly and with the right kind of framework. And here it's very important to recognize that this is the moment where the priority for these institutions has to be to help the countries in terms of spending that money to deal with the immediate crisis. This is not the moment to tie up that financing in bureaucracy or in conditionality that may be very useful in normal times, but in a crisis, this is not the moment to try and fix uh, uh, ill-functioning public enterprises or to try and improve trade policy. Those are all issues we will need to come back to. So immediate priority, get the financing out as quickly as possible to help countries deal with the immediate uh, needs. Recognize, however, two things. One is that uh, what we do now has an impact in the long term. If you look at the global financial crisis, six years after that, developing countries as a whole were still well below the trend on which they were before. So this crisis, if we don't advance all the support that we can right now in the magnitude and in the ways in which it is appropriate, we're going to end up paying a price for it for a decade to come in terms of the uh, progress on development goals. The second thing that's important to recognize is that the way in which you get this out is going to have to rely largely on the multilateral institutions because the multilateral institutions and the UN institutions in this regard are better equipped with their infrastructure to be able to do programming of financing and of grants now than many of the bilateral institutions are. So there's going to be a natural tendency in countries to be able to see how they can scale up their own uh, operations in donor countries. But I think now is the moment to actually focus on the multilateral institutions that we have created and work with them. And the final thing to remember is that there are a whole set of questions that this immediate response will raise down the road. One of them is going to be about whether these institutions, the World Bank, the regional development banks, the IMF, need additional resources beyond the ones that they can mobilize from their current uh, uh, legislative frameworks. Maybe they will, but focus on that a little way down the road because a discussion about opening up new financing arrangements could get in the way of getting the financing that they can mobilize to the countries that they need it. Similarly, we'll have to come back to whether some of this is going to make debt that is already uh, strained and, and possibly unsustainable in a bunch of uh, low-income countries even more of a problem down the road. Maybe we will need to come back to some form of debt restructuring or debt write-offs down the road. That is a discussion, again, that we're going to have later. Now is not the moment to engage in a conversation on things that get in the way of providing the urgent support that they do. So I guess my bottom line right now is that the need is unprecedented. It will largely be met from external sources, and those external sources have to be the official financing institutions. The focus needs to be for each of them to step up and go as far as they can within their existing frameworks and then we can have a conversation about how to deal with the longer term consequences down the road. Thank you, Masood. Um, let's now turn to Scott Morris. He's a senior fellow uh, at, the, at the Center for Global Development and he'll tell us a little bit about what we can expect from the World Bank. What could the World Bank be doing in this space along with the rest of the regional development banks? Thanks, Scott. Uh, thanks, Amanda. So, yeah, I want to uh, spend my time essentially building on uh, Masood's remarks uh, around the multilateral development banks and um, explaining um, this uh, dollar figure that uh, my fellow pan panelist Nancy Lee and our colleague Clemence Landers uh, came up with, which sort of sort of sets a headline number of a trillion dollars when it comes to collective MDB response. So. Uh, 
I, I want to sort of break that down a little bit. But but just to put that in a little bit of context and building on uh, Masood and Brad's remarks, you know, I think it is likely if you decide. It, it has been more of a bottom-up approach. They sort of identified here are the things we want to do and here's how much we can spend on those things. I think we have to start by acknowledging that you know there's a huge amount of uncertainty about the months ahead um, in terms of need, uh, but also um, how to spend the money and, and how to do it uh, in a way that, that meets the crisis needs. And that's going to take some time to work through the complexity of of uh, particularly in low-income countries, um, how do you get money to where it needs to go quickly? But we shouldn't wait on that to be able to to identify sort of the envelope of financing that is possible. And I think even that kind of announcement uh, has an important near-term effect. And I think you know, which is why you know we did the exercise of trying to identify an envelope for the MDBs because I think particularly for bodies like the G20, it really is an important aspect of, of their statements that they, they begin to put some big numbers, frankly, uh, in, in, in what they're committed to doing and particularly working through the IMF and the MDBs. I think it provides the, the necessary reassurance to the borrowing countries about uh, what they can have available to them as they do their planning um, some reassurance to, to private markets about a backstop that will exist for these countries. So I think it is an important element of it, even if, frankly, we don't know exactly how it's going to be spent um, at this moment. Um, it also helps, I think, frankly, when you consider a body like the G20, so basically wealthy and large economy countries that can effectively um, sort of make decisions for these multilateral institutions, you do have to work through the politics of a lot of this. And I think it's important early to get them on board with sort of maximalist thinking about scale of financing so that we don't have sort of this, these sort of uh, slow iterations and incremental shifts to, oh, we have to go bigger, we have to go bigger. Much better that they start uh, from the standpoint of a big number. So our trillion dollar estimate, let me try to break that down a little bit for the multilateral development banks. And um, just to be clear, we are talking, you know, first and foremost about the World Bank, the largest of these institutions, but there are also a handful of core regional uh, development banks uh, that we add to our estimates that, you know, um, we do expect to act in a coordinated fashion, particularly in crisis moments. And, and, and we saw that with the global financial crisis. Um, so what we wanted to try to understand is, you know, let's set aside sort of normal, uh, normal uh, conditions and the lending standards that these institutions have, which are largely a function of uh, making their own lending as cheap as possible, which depends on their own AAA ratings on their bonds. Um, and to do that, they, you know, they have what everyone would agree are, are frankly very conservative. Uh, financial uh, policies, um, and they rely on essentially equ equity to loan um, uh, measures of, of, of what their lending should be. And critically, uh, that definition of equity is, is strictly uh, defined around the capital that their shareholders have paid into the institutions over the years and the reserves that they have on hand. Now, uh, that that you know, so that defines what what is possible uh, in in normal times, and and if you look at the MDB system as a whole, uh, current exposures are are something like half a trillion dollars. Um, we then say, actually, if you look at the statutory limits of what these banks are allowed uh, to lend, uh, that number does jump to a trillion dollars pretty easily. So so how do you get there? Um, basically, if you look at the charters of the institutions themselves, uh, the charters say uh, that essentially uh, outstanding exposure, the outstanding loans um, cannot exceed the total capital and reserves of the institutions. And here the total cap capital is the important concept because total capital is that paid in capital, uh, but it is also something called callable capital. 
uh, that exists for each of the institutions, and in fact exists in much as a much greater share of total capital than the paid in. So what is this callable capital? It is essentially a commitment by the shareholder countries that in the event the MDB itself is unable to service its debt, uh, the shareholders will uh, pay in additional capital to the institution, and that is specified in, in actual dollar amounts uh, that is defined in each of the rounds of capital increases that the banks have had over the years. So you essentially have sort of a standing stock of this callable capital that is on the books. Um, there's frankly a fair amount of complexity to uh, to a call on capital. I think what is important to emphasize here though is that uh, in recognizing the value of this callable capital, it is by no means suggesting that there's going to be a call on the capital. And I would, you know, I would argue you to be, even in the environment, the highly uncertain environment that we're facing, it would be the worst kind of doomsday scenario that would have this kind of call. Um, because, you know, ultimately the value of the bank's uh, own bonds is directly tied to um, sort of the sort of the the position of its largest shareholders, um, their ability to finance themselves. So really, um, it is not a dramatic step uh, in a crisis environment to to recognize that callable capital exists. Uh, it does exist, um, and to lend with with that understanding. And again, I would emphasize that it, you know, we are still far removed from a circumstance where the banks. Um, are are unable uh, to to service their own, their own debt, and they would would have to proceed with with these kinds of calls uh, for their shareholders to step in and provide more capital. Um, so, with that kind of recognition, that does get you to what we would call the legal limits of of MDB lending, given their current resources of of a trillion dollars and more. I you know I would argue that we actually sort of set. The, the lower end of, of, a, of, of a maximalist uh, lending approach, in part by defining as probably a smaller number of institutions than one could define. Uh, you know, we did not include, for example, an institution like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, some of the other regional institutions that have historically not been defined as the core, but are, do have the ability uh, to lend. Um, the other, a, a couple of other points just to close on this. Um, one is that I would say, you know, this is really defining near-term capacity. Um, I think it is important to recognize, as we saw with the global financial crisis, that uh, with a, a massive ramp up in lending uh, for these institutions, at some point, uh, whether it's two years from now, three years, you then have to answer the question of, okay, what does normal look like again? Where do we want the banks to be? in their lending outside of a crisis period? And are we even outside of that crisis period when it comes to a lot of the borrowing countries? Uh, because it is the case that lending at these levels won't be sustainable. Um, so there's either some scaling back down uh, or it will be a moment when the shareholders do have to step up again and be willing to put uh, additional capital in, in the institutions uh, as they did uh, in the years following the, the global financial crisis. Uh, it's always important to emphasize with these capital increases that um, that paid in capital number is, is actually quite modest uh, uh, for the shareholders in the scheme of things. Um, as, as much as it can be leveraged to sort of dramatic levels where you go from billions to trillions, um, the, the actual paid in capital is fairly modest in size. So even if we are facing a moment a couple of years down the road of more capital increases, um, that that should not uh, panic anyone. Uh, I think it's the normal course of business, and particularly if it's happening at a point of recovery uh, for for the large uh, for the large countries. Um, last thing I will say is um, it's also important to recognize. Uh, uh, terms of financing and types of financing coming from the MDBs, because what we did in our exercise was sort of define uh, the full envelope. Um, it's it's really critical to understand uh, different financing needs of low-income countries versus, versus emerging market countries. Uh, concessionality matters, uh, perhaps less so in a crisis, 
where uh, there's a greater emphasis on overall scale of financing quickly. Uh, but uh, the, the point about concessionality and the terms of the World Bank that go to low-income countries, which are, are zero interest rate, very long-term loans, long grace periods, that ultimately does de depend on the willingness of donors to continue to provide support. So you have these ongoing rounds of replenishments of the bank's funds, uh, but I, I, it, it's, it seems to me that, that uh, any donor response to this crisis will entail some increase in contributions uh, to these institutions uh, to subsidize the, the, the lending uh, for, for the poorest countries. Um, I will, I will um, with Amanda's promise, we'll come back to debt relief, so I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, I think uh, Brad teed it up well, and, and I think it, it is important to come to back, come back to that, to think about uh, how does debt relief sit alongside direct financing and, and, and sort of the, in the landscape of creditors with the MDBs being a critical uh, set of actors, uh, how should we think about that? So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. And now let's go to Nancy Lee. She's a senior fellow here at the Center for Global Development as well. And she'll talk uh, a bit more about uh, development finance institutions and their role, as well as uh, how she sees the outlook. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I will then pick up, I think, on two pieces of this conversation. Uh, one is the plight of low-income countries this during this crisis. And in, in addition, talk about the private finance arms of the development banks. So first of all, for all of the reasons that Brad enumerated, um, this time I think is going to be very different for low-income countries than the global financial crisis. They're entering this very dangerous period with much higher debt levels, much more integrated in um, the global financial flows. And therefore, they're subject to all of the the crisis transmission uh, channels that Brad uh, mentioned, including a sudden stop in capital flows, which we are certainly seeing in emerging markets. So as both Masood and Scott alluded to, the, the development banks are going to have to step up for low-income countries in a way that they really didn't have to step up in the global financial crisis. Uh, during that period, World Bank lending to um, IBRD countries, the higher income developing countries increased by about 140 percent in the period immediately after the crisis. Um, the increase in lending to IDA countries uh, was, was uh, much less. It was about 50 percent. So this is not a question of either or between middle income countries and low income countries. It's both. And that's one of the main reasons that the numbers that we're all talking about are so big. Um, Low-income countries are going to need fiscal packages of large size, just in the same way that other countries are, uh, are need them. In a, in a low-income country, a collapse in, in income due to this kind of crisis is a collapse in consumption, and particularly for poor people. So fiscal packages are essential. Um, we've done some rough calculations, and we come up with a number for all IDA countries of the kind of additional spending needed. Um, that could reach something like $200 billion. So that's a big part of the larger numbers that everyone is talking about. Now, turning to the development finance institutions that do private finance. So what's now a health and, and an economic crisis could very easily and very likely turn into financial crises in developing countries. Um, their banking systems are vulnerable to uh, sovereign debt servicing problems, because they hold a lot of that paper, usually. They're vulnerable to rising non-performing loans. They're vulnerable to currency volatility. So an extraordinary effort here is not just needed for the uh, arms of these institutions that lend to governments. It's also needed for the parts of the institutions that lend to the private sector. So we can look back at the previous financial crisis. And the record, I have to say, is pretty mixed. Um, if you look at the uh, independent evaluations of their performance, um, some of them were 
cyclical rather than counter cyclical. Um, in, in at least one institution, lending dropped in the year after uh, the, the crisis. Um, some of them were slow in getting their new initiatives started. Um, there was, in some cases, a disconnect between the kinds of products they were offering and the kinds of products that were uh, needed. Some had some success in trade finance, but as we've just heard, um, we're in an entirely different set of circumstances with a supply shock, and recovery in trade in the near term is very uncertain and probably unlikely. So um, trade finance can't be the focus, uh, or at least the only focus, of these institutions. So I think we need to learn the lessons of the last crisis. Um, and uh, let me suggest that these banks uh, through their private sector arms are going to have to do some things that they didn't do last time or do more more of some things that they did very little of last time. Let me suggest five things in particular. First of all, I think there likely will have to be a shift in the composition of the products they offer toward more subordinated products like subordinated debt or equity. Their bank clients are not just going to need liquidity or credit lines. They're probably also going to need capital to shore up their balance sheets. So these are high-risk kinds of products for these institutions. But if they aren't there, if the development banks aren't there, no one else is going to be there. Second, I think these banks, the development banks, are going to have to take a larger share of repayment risk. Um, to ease the burden on the financial institution clients and the firms that they serve. That, in many cases, means local currency risk. So a lot more of the lending is going to have to be in local currency uh, this time around. Third, speed is critical. Um, and I think rather than focusing only on new money to their private clients, I think these banks ought to consider something like restructuring their existing credits to provide near-term relief in uh, repayments. And that, in some cases, can be done quicker than negotiating new, uh, new money instruments. Uh, fourth, um, they should think about ways to extend the benefits of their finance beyond the financial institutions and firms to the workers um, employed by the firms. So why don't they start thinking about rewarding borrowing firms, maybe ex post, for retaining workers on payroll? They could consider things like partial loan forgiveness or interest rates discounts if the firms to which they lend uh, maintain the workers on the payroll. And then finally, collaboration. This is not a time for competition among the development finance institutions. Risks will be very high. Everything I've just talked about are, are, is, entails a lot of risk. It makes a huge amount of sense for these institutions to collaborate, to share risk, uh, and to scale their finance. Uh, just one last point, and that's about the shareholders of these institutions, um, which Scott was uh, just mentioning. Um, this is not just a moment of, for leadership by the management and the staffs of these institutions. It's a moment of leadership by the shareholders, uh, in part through the G7 and the G20. We have not seen so far any clear guidance to these institutions with respect to how they should make these trade-offs between the very high risks and the balance sheet damage and the extraordinary uh, ramping up of finance that we're asking them to take. So this is not a time for mixed messages from the shareholders. Um, they got to be very clear uh, about their willingness to tolerate some balance sheet deterioration in the near term. And in the longer term, I would say this crisis and the last one um, points up a common lesson, which is that there's really, a, you could argue, a piece missing in the global architecture, um, an entity which is capable of providing these subordinated product, products, taking a lot more risk and accepting uh, lower than market returns. And before the crisis, we proposed such an entity, and we called it the stretch fund, um, as a way to fill in this gap in the development finance architecture. I think the crisis itself only strengthens the case for uh, developing something like this. So I would urge shareholders um, to take a look at this and, and um, 
work on creating something like this, not just for the current circumstances, but for all of the crises to come. Thanks. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I understand that we had some audio problems when we kicked off at the start of our session. So I'm going to ask, and, and apologies for this panelist, and we'll now, uh, the next event is going to be flawless, no worries. But can I ask uh, Brad, if we could, Brad Tetzer is a Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he was talking very importantly about the role that the Fed has had in the initial response and why it's so important that the IMF and the other multilateral banks, development banks come back in. Brad, can I ask you to do a short summary of, of your original comments so that we can make sure that they're reflected uh, in, in the, on the event? You're muted. Brad, you're muted. So the Fed can supply short-term financing in dollars uh, through its counterpart central banks globally to meet short-term needs that arise amongst financial institutions, financial institutions that need to raise dollars to extend trade financing in dollars, financial institutions that need dollars in order to provide dollar hedges to a range of institutions. The most obvious are life insurers who typically hold long-term U.S. corporate bonds and need to hedge the currency risk. That is the role the Fed can play and the role the Fed is playing. What the Fed really cannot do is make up for a shortfall in underlying reserves, make up for longer term falls in private financial inflows, and make up for the loss in export income from commodity price shocks, from the loss in tourism revenue, uh, and from the contraction in manufacturing trade. There are a host of classic balance of payments financing needs that have arisen in the global economy. Financing needs, which are not needs for 90-day bank financing, but are needs for multi-year loans uh, to countries that should have the capacity to repay, but won't be able to repay quickly. And that kind of financing is what the IMF was set up to do. The IMF, with its quota resources, with the resources from an expanded or re-expanded new arrangement to borrow, and with the supplementary financing provided by its third line backup bilateral credits, can, I think, mobilize up to a trillion dollars in new lending capacity. And it should use that to make up for the fall off in balance of payments inflows to emerging and low income countries and to allow countries to expand their budgets as needed to support public health and make income support payments available to those who have lost their jobs. Thanks, Brad. And then, Masu, could you uh, give us a short wrap up of what you also said earlier? Uh, you talked about uh, the importance of uh, an aggressive uh, approach by the World Bank. Um, and I wonder if you could also add a bit of a reflection on the need for grant financing. Uh, that's a bit like Ida that we've discussed with Scott and, and Nancy for low-income countries, but outside of governments themselves, there's also a need for humanitarian finance. Could you address some of those issues? Sure. Um, and I'm sorry that we had the audio problem before, but so let me just say, you know, kind of the first thing I do want to reiterate, and, and apologies to those who heard this before, is that this is going to be an unprecedented shock, much larger for the developing countries and low-income countries than the global financial crisis was, partly because in addition to all the external shocks that come from lower commodity prices, lower trade, uh, from lower uh, finance from the private markets, there is a domestic supply shock that actually comes from the epidemic itself, which is still about to unfold 
in many, many countries. So I think it's just important to recognize that this is going to be a shock of a magnitude that we have not seen uh, in many of our lifetimes. And consequently, it requires the same kind of response. The, the second point I want to make is, uh, is to pick up on what Brad was saying, that this response for the developing countries and for most of the low-income countries has to come from the international financial institutions stepping up. Why? Because private markets are not going to be able to finance most of them. They will be much more uh, risk averse in the period going ahead. In fact, twice as much money has pulled out in terms of portfolio flows from developing countries in the last uh, three months than in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Secondly, they also do not have, many of them, the reserves themselves to draw upon. Some do, and they should, but for most of them, they need to get help. And that's why this is the moment for the IMF, for the development banks, uh, and for other institutions to step up, official institutions to step up. The IMF has estimated the financing needs uh, to be about two and a half trillion dollars. Uh, that is likely to be a conservative estimate. In my view, by the time we finish, we're going to end up with a larger number. But with their current financing, as Brad has said and Scott mentioned, between the MDBs and the IMF, if they really go the whole way, if they step out of their comfort zones, they should be able to provide a substantial response in the near term. Now, two other things that I do want to say. One is that, uh, what does stepping out of their comfort zones mean? Well, one thing it means is to focus in the near term on the things that matter in helping countries deal with the crisis. Most emerging market developing country policymakers today are looking for help on how to spend the money most effectively. Should they scale up cash transfers where they can, where they don't have those systems, what other ways are there to shore up incomes during the middle of this crisis? That's where the multilateral institutions can provide technical advice. So focus on that, not the time to focus on some of the traditional things that, that rightly these institutions focus on, on how to make the economies function more efficiently in terms of their public enterprises or their trade policy. A second way of stepping out of the comfort zone, a point that Nancy made. This is the moment for these institutions to provide uh, non-concessional money of their own to low-income countries where this is needed to supplement the concessional resources that they have. Because even the non-concessional money from the IMF is two or three percent interest today. Same thing with the IBRD. That is a whole lot cheaper than the money that some of these countries have actually been borrowing, the low-income countries have been borrowing on commercial markets, which has got them into some of the debt problems that many of them face today. And the third important way in which they have to step out of their comfort zone is to recognize that some issues will need to be dealt with tomorrow rather than today. Today, if the priority is use the resource capacity you have get the money out, help the countries to deal with the immediate crisis. Tomorrow, we will have to deal with what does this mean for the issue of debt sustainability and uh, whether or not we will need some degree of debt relief in one form or the other by stretching out maturities or by providing outright write downs down the road. That question will need to be addressed. Similarly, tomorrow we will need to address whether the capital base of these institutions needs to be augmented, whether or not we need to come back, and Scott was referring to this, whether we need to come back and provide financing uh, additional financing capacity to the MDB system uh, to be able to deal with the uh, beyond the crisis needs that they're going to have. But right now, my uh, personal uh, uh, plea is for people to focus on using the capacity that we have imaginatively and boldly, maximize what we can deliver, and do not get entangled in the next few weeks or months in a conversation that is going to detract from our ability 
to deliver the support that these countries need. For most of us today, you know, the trade-offs are between we, we talk about the economy and, and health trade-offs in rich countries. And, and, and then if you think about what is the consequence of the same conversation in low-income countries, you know, basically there, there, most households have no capacity to draw down their personal reserves. So for them, the trade-off really is one that actually, as, as some prime ministers in, in developing countries have put it, they are going to be uh, facing starvation soon. Uh, unless we can get some support to them. So I think that is an important uh, point that we need to just recognize. Thanks, Masood. And let me ask, uh, starting maybe uh, with Brad and, and Scott, if, if we're if speaking to these bilat the bilateral sources, let's say US, China, UK, uh, what's the list of to do's? You talked about, um, uh, they they need to act on the board to make sure that there's um, uh, the adequate as most money that's available that all their instruments are being used. Um, you talked about uh, the bilateral lines at the IMF that need to be uh, renewed. Uh, we talked about a need for additional concessional financing. Could you sort of give us the four or five bullet points that those country member countries need to have on their agenda going into the next weeks, Brad? So I think they're uh, all focus on what they can do as creditors themselves and what they can do through the IMF. You know, the U.S. and China have already extended a set of government-to-government uh, -government loans to a range of countries, China more so than the U.S. Right now, though payments on existing loans should be rescheduled so that countries don't have to use limited financial resources to repay long-term loans to fellow governments. So I think that's something that is easily within uh, the capacity of most governments. It, rescheduling existing credits doesn't mean recognizing a loss, it just means recognizing that payments cannot be paid now. The US and China and others should be working very aggressively to expand the IMF's lending capacity so that it can deliver as much as possible. One way they can do so is that the new arrangement to borrow, which now provides, let's say 225, maybe 250 billion, depending on the exchange rate of lending capacity, is scheduled to double in size at the end of the year. The US already has approval to raise its contribution to the new arrangement to borrow. The IMF, all the shareholders should be working together to pull that lending capacity forward. They should also maintain bilateral lending commitments, which were scheduled to fall at the end of this year at their current level. Bilateral lending is, is additional credit that countries that have the capacity have provided to the IMF so that the IMF can then lend it out. That capacity is scheduled to fall from 400 billion to under 200. We should be working, keep it at the 400 billion level. That's how you expand the envelope without making any radical shifts in the structure of the institution. And those are things that can be done quickly. Finally, I think the US should support an SDR allocation of 500 billion, which gives about 200 billion to developing countries and gives a substantial amount of additional reserves to the United States as well. Uh, at a time when the US is using its existing reserves to backstop money market funds. I think that's actually helpful to the United States. The, this is a time when I think the advantages of giving everyone additional reserves are quite significant and the drawbacks are small. In the face of a common shock, a common response seems to be called for. So between that, those sets of measures, I think the U.S. and the other major shareholders can meet a substantial part of that two trillion plus need that Masood has mentioned. Thanks. Excellent. So, um, and go ahead, Scott. Yeah. So just on um, Amanda, I, I would say three things. Um, the first is just to strongly endorse what Brad said about the role of bilateral creditors um, and certainly rescheduling. I think there's still a bigger conversation about the role of debt relief and alluding to Masood's earlier remarks on that, I think it's important to think 
really think it through before jumping in aggressively as, as you know in terms of top of list and we can come back to that um number two i think you know particularly for the large countries really taking coordination seriously in terms of joint actions through the international financial institutions and again this comes back to the role of the g20 and i think to date, um, the statements have been a disappointment. I don't think they've been a disaster. I, I guess my optimistic take is that this is, you know, they're still buying themselves time to work through uh, what the bold statement will look like. Um, and I hope that comes in the, in the form of an action plan. But you really do. So if we, you know, come back to that trillion dollar number for the MDBs. Uh, the MDBs are not going to self-coordinate on that, the, you know, the management of the institution. It really is for these large countries to drive that kind of coordinated high-level response. So I, I think that's, that's really critical. And, and, you know, you effectively do need the G20 to do that because the G7 doesn't have China at the table. You need China at the table, not to mention other large emerging markets. Um, and then finally, um, I think there is a role in, in forward funding um, sort of the donor money that is going into the institutions. So these are existing commitments, uh, whether it's something like the IDA replenishment at the World Bank. Um, you know, I was very pleased, and I think the, the U.S. administration and the Congress deserve credit for expediting uh, the authorities that are needed. Uh, that included the new arrangements to borrow at the fund. That, you know, that's why we're in this good position for the U.S. as the Congress took that on. Um, I think as a next step, it would be good to see them um, move forward as quickly as possible with what would otherwise be sort of a, a later in the year annual funding commitment. Um, and then another part of that, um, and this falls in the category of some things are actually easier to do in a crisis than in normal times. The U.S. Uh, stands alone among donors to these institutions in not being current with its commitments. And there's this body of funds that we call arrears that are essentially past due that have accumulated over many years, it's now over $2 billion. This is a very good opportunity to put that money into the institutions at a time when it is needed and can be spent effectively and then deals with a longstanding headache. Um, arrears are an issue across the multilateral system. Um, I think it's a good opportunity in a crisis period um, to break through all of the, the sort of the petty politics of that and just get it done. Thanks, Scott. Uh, just to drill down on this, uh, the idea of extending the government to government loans, uh, David Malpass and Christine, Kristalina Georgieva called on bilateral creditors in the same sense. They talked about a moratorium on debt payments and even outright debt forgiveness, and that call has been echoed by a number of non-governmental organizations. On the other hand, you've spoken about the, the, the priority being really cash into these systems as quickly as possible. Is debt relief and forgiveness the way, or is it about rescheduling and extension? Can you just be um, very explicit on that? And what, what would you say to the advocacy community in this space? Brad? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? I was looking at some of the questions. <laughs> Sorry, or maybe I'll ask uh, Scott to start. Um, you, you've talked about <laughs> extending the terms of the government to government loans, rescheduling the debt. On the other hand, we've also heard uh, calls for a moratorium on debt payments or outright debt forgiveness. How, th this is a bit of a continuum of measures. What exactly is it that we think is the right way forward? What do you see as the right way forward? What, what would you like to see advocates asking for if all of our goals is to get more money into these systems as soon as possible? So, yeah, I guess I'll go, I'll go first to, um, just to say, and Brad laid out in his initial remarks um, that, you know, the, particularly for the bilateral creditors, uh, rescheduling just really is, is important and useful right now. And I think it's, it's important to recognize for the lower income countries, uh, this is the largest single category of creditor for their external credits. Um, so um, that is where the money is, uh, the multilateral institutions uh, as well, but it actually has been the bilaterals in recent years that have emerged China is a big driver of that, um, so a lot of this falls to China. Um, but I think, you know, stepping back in the big, bigger picture on the debt issues, 
Um, number one, you know, I think we should recognize, particularly for the lower income countries, when we sort of throw around the idea of broad-based debt relief, actual debt forgiveness, this is a very different context than, than prior, the so-called HIPAA initiative, you know, which was dealing with long-term structural issues for these countries in what was otherwise not a crisis period, certainly in the global economy. Um, and it was a very sort of slow moving cumbersome process that entailed a lot of conditionality, the kinds of things Masood was alluding to that frankly, you don't wanna take on in a crisis period. So I think there's sort of this overriding imperative to recognize what are the measures uh, and instruments that will get money out quickly. Um, if you can, you know, quick debt reschedule, rescheduling falls in that category, alleviating uh, immediate payments, yes. What I worry about, um, and as much as I like that the, the heads of the bank and the fund were out there with this call, if it becomes sort of a dominant top of list thing, it, it quickly snowballs into a broader effort to pull in the multilaterals themselves, which is, it, which is a very complicated uh, endeavor of uh, how do they write down debt in a way that doesn't impair their ability to, to lend new money right now. Um, bringing in the, the, the bondholders uh, and negotiating with, with private creditors around this stuff. Uh, you know, those are all challenging things. I, I worry that to take on the, that full package of, of actors and measures um, becomes overly cumbersome and sort of loses, you know, loses um, the target of, you know, how are we maximizing financing for these countries uh, today. But the, you know, all of that said, you know, we have to recognize what is probably the inevitable. Uh, e even before this crisis, a majority of low-income country governments were either at high debt risk, high risk of debt distress or were in debt distress. So this has been a growing problem already for these countries uh, and it's not gonna get e better. Nancy or Brad, did you want to add to that or should we go on to the next question? Um, I'll add a, one, a couple of quick thoughts. Uh, the first is to reinforce something that Masood said, which is focus on what needs to be done now and don't let things that, problems that ha have to be solved eventually get in the way of solving problems that can be solved now. So the bilateral creditors can just agree proactively and preemptively to reschedule all payments coming due. Uh, that achieves much the same effect as a broad moratorium. It does mean that payments are being deferred, some interest is being added to your stock of debt, and there will be countries that won't be able to repay that. But we can sort that out, in my view, later. We don't know where the long-run price of oil is going to be. We don't know where the long-run price of many commodities will be. We don't know how rapidly global trade will recover. Those are all important variables to assessing long-term repayment capacity. So in the short run, push payments out. And if there are problems that emerge, solve those problems later. The usual disadvantage of just deferring payments is that it makes it harder to attract new inflows. But in the near term, new inflows are gonna come from preferred creditors like the IFIs who can afford to take risk. And realistically, private markets aren't going to be able to supply much funding over the next couple of years. So the usual arguments for sorting out long-run debt capacity aren't as pressing right now. There are exceptions. Argentina, Lebanon are already in debt restructurings. Uh, they need uh, to accelerate those private debt restructurings or just accept an extended period of non-payment. But in general, take advantage of the fact that bilateral creditors can push out payments and the cost of doing so from their balance sheet or point of view is very low. Just, just to add, let, let me add one thing to that, um, uh, to what Brad said, Amanda, which is, um, if you look at the magnitude of payments owed by low-income countries to the various creditors, the multilaterals, the bilaterals, and the private sector, the single largest chunk of debt service is actually to the bilateral creditors. 
even though the debt stock for multilaterals is bigger, since so much of that lending is concessional, the debt service is actually lower. So to add to the logic or the rationale for this, um, it is the single largest source of um, debt payment relief that you could provide to at least low-income countries. Thanks. I think that, that makes the situation quite clear. Now let's turn to some of the questions that have come in um, via the audience. Um, let's start with a colleague from the Inter International Fund for Agricultural Development who has talked about, I mean, I think we've uh, dealt with some of this, but he's asking, you know, we're asking the major donors to the IFVs to take some additional measures. Some of them are um, not, don't give a hit, uh, much of a hit to our own bottom line. But uh, he's asking, with so many donors facing severe crises themselves, what are other options that could allow multilaterals to avoid asking the usual suspects to open up their wallets? I think we've talked about this, but is there anything else you would want to add about um, what, what should we worry about if the, if, if the biggest sources of funding into the IFVs are the usual suspects um, and they are themselves under an enormous amount of fiscal pressure? We've, I think uh, we've outlined a great plan that makes it quite feasible without huge outlays, but um, is there a point at which we start to worry about that issue? Um, is it within a year or is it sooner than that? Uh, can Rashid? I just come in on that, uh, Amanda? The, just to say, look, yeah, th there will be a point where these institutions will need resources, but Two things to remember, if, you know, as, as Brad and others have reinforced, it's not right now. So we'll, let's start that conversation or somewhat slower track and, and we'll come to that in a year or, or 18 months. And the second thing is remember the markets are becoming very risk averse. And in a risk averse world, these institutions are very attractive places to which people with assets want to lend. So they will be able to borrow at attractive terms for a long, long time. And so there's a lot of money that was you know, previously going directly to emerging markets, which is going to be uh, pulling out of there, but, but will be looking for places like the MDBs and others to, to lend to. And then I would say that the final thing on that is that they can borrow and we can think about how they can borrow, but ultimately, there will need to be a reckoning in terms of the call on public capital in the rich countries of the world to be able to share more uh, to, of the cost for dealing with the consequences of this crisis, not just at home, but internationally uh, over time. So a lot of what we have been talking about are ways in which you know, you can provide additional financing without an immediate call on the capital of the public budgets of the rich countries. And, and that's fine for now, because right now we need to get the money out and, and the rich countries themselves, most of them are struggling to deal with the pandemic itself. But down the road, we shouldn't kid ourselves that one consequence of this will not be that the rich countries will need to think about how they can put in some more public capital, either to shore up the capital base of these institutions or to provide direct financing in the form of grants because, uh, or to help deal with some of the costs of any debt relief that is coming down the pike. So I think that is just, we're parking that for later, but we shouldn't leave the impression that there's no consequence. Well, and I think we should also note that there are three replenishments of concessional financing facilities that were scheduled for 2020 that are also really important. So the Gavi Alliance that provides vaccines for children in low-income countries, IFAD itself, um, the Asian Development Fund. Um, so there are those asks. And then there's an ask, obviously, from the UN system for the humanitarian response. Um, those add up to, you know, what, five, five to $6 billion. Do you foresee an issue or are some of these stimulus efforts going on in the higher income countries going to be sufficient to address these replenishments that are also vital in putting together that big number that you talked about, especially for low income countries? 
I think that uh, these are at different stages, right? So the replenishments are of Gavi and uh, IFAD are, are coming along, and I don't see any reason right now why the current pandemic would slow down the willingness to respond and complete those replenishments. I think if anything, it's going to give added impetus to complete this. UN ask is a different kind of ask. The UN ask essentially is putting together what the world needs uh, to be able to respond to this crisis on the one hand, and how much of that could usefully go through UN organizations, either in the humanitarian space or more generally to support uh, developing countries. And that's where I think the, the challenge will be to keep the donors to the UN system committed to supporting that set of channels based on the recognition that in the middle of a crisis, many UN organizations are best placed to provide the kind of field delivery of relief that bilateral organizations uh, are going to be harder put to do because many of them are actually pulling back right now their own stuff. So, so it's very hard for them to be able to provide the support. The U.S. is always much easier, much more likely to be in the front line in difficult situations. Thanks. Uh, Nancy, we received a question that asks about uh, the issue of the DFIs and um, their role in this space. It asks, uh, an important proportion of blended finance has been targeted to the infrastructure sector, but considering COVID, should blended finance focus now on other sectors? That's from Rasik Niembro. Um, I, I would say as a general principle, the purpose of um, DFI finance to the private sector at this stage is a macroeconomic purpose. It is essentially to help sustain um, uh, demand and supply um, through uh, um, ensuring some level of financial intermediation in these countries. So you basically need lending to, you know, micro, small, medium enterprises generally. And I would say you need to continue as much as possible the infrastructure investment that includes some private participation because that's a source of demand, construction demand and other demand. So what you're trying to do is um, sustain the financial flows in order to sustain uh, some level of income generation and demand. Um, having said that, however, you do want to use the private sector to do the kinds of things that the private sector does well. And one of those things is to innovate to get goods and services to people that otherwise might not get them, and that could include health services. So remote populations, excluded populations, that the public health systems are not reaching uh, in low-income countries could benefit from uh, firms, you know, innovative firms that are able to provide these, some, some health services, maybe not COVID-19 health services, but other health services through, you know, new kinds of distribution channels, you know, drones and other things that the private sector is well placed to, um, uh, um, you know, create new business models uh, that can provide the, the, um, the uh, you know, better service delivery. So I would say the main focus should be macro, but there, that, but a sort of innovation in the, in key services is also a key part for blended finance. Thanks, Nancy. There are a couple questions about. Uh, hey, Amanda, the, can I the, just one yeah, one ahead. other thought on on that point? Because I so I think there's still an unanswered question, particularly for the MDB. So, you know, thinking of infrastructure as a long term investment activity for these countries, and it and, you know it is still the single largest thing that the MDBs do uh, with their their partner countries. I think the unanswered question is in this crisis moment, how prepared are these institutions to figure out consumption and, and channeling money toward consumption activities on a large scale? Uh, because I think there's, you know, I think one of the things we saw in the global financial crisis was, well, you know, we are pulling forward, we are expediting existing projects in the pipeline. But if these are projects that, you know, that still have sort of a 10 year timeline to them, um, I'm not sure that that's the right priority. And I think, 
Um, again, you know, in, in Masood's remarks, he talked about things like cash transfers, but then thinking through the challenges of limited coverage of those. I think there's a really difficult set of questions that I hope the institutions uh, are try trying very hard right now to figure out. You know, one of the you know one of the answers to it is what we would expect is to see a shift toward a lot of budget support uh, coming from the MDB, so not doing project lending. Uh, but even that, in turn, depends on the, then those governments having some ability to program that money toward social safety net effectively on a, on a broad basis. Um, I, I think you're starting to go, uh, and we're having some questions on sort of the use of those funds that, that would go into uh, low middle income countries. There's a question about um, how all of this intersects with uh, governments that are uh, weak um, uh, or fragile by internal strife. We're talking about Libya, Central African Republic. I mean, what uh, would, what would you watch for? What kinds of uh, measures could be taken? Um, there's also some questions about uh, how could uh, the IFIs help with the issue of job losses, how to decide between spending within the health sector versus the safety net. Um, do you have any thoughts on that as a group? Yeah, can I just uh, say one thing on that, please, Amanda, which is, you know, the, the really urgent priority now would be to sit with each country, just as we do after a natural disaster, and you come up with a disaster recovery plan. We really need, this is the moment for the international community to be sitting and helping each country come up with a plan to shore up incomes and to keep the economy going as best as they can under the circumstances. And the mix of measures is going to differ from country to country depending on where they start from. So if you take the fragile states, it's gonna be the hardest there because in those countries, for example, governments are less likely to be trusted. They're less likely to have a, a structure to be able to get income support out to, uh, to individuals. And maybe people have to rely on very unorthodox measures. You know, you might put a moratorium on the payment of electricity bills for the poorest, uh, for the people who consume the least amount of electricity. Take some bar like that. And that's the kind of thing that in normal circumstances, I would be very uncomfortable uh, recommending. And, and most uh, institutions uh, would be uh, very uncomfortable supporting because it actually is one of the reasons why we have these chronic budget deficits in a lot of state enterprises in, in countries. But in today's world, I guess we have to really be willing to explore what works in the country context rather than go in with a package of here are the five things that every country has to adopt because those five things are going to be very different country to country. And I mean, the other uh, point, you know, one question also is that should money go through government only or should we think about other kinds of organizations that can execute in fragile countries or in places that don't have uh, much government activity that's effective. Uh, one of our uh, audience, uh, Susugo Dose, asked about um, how is it that um, non-governmental organizations in these countries are going to be able to continue working uh, without some government support for that use. Um, there is also I, a question just, from our, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to add on that very point. Um, you know, what you want to do is reach, if you're going to reach non-governmental organizations or non-governmental um, uh, yeah, companies, you want to reach, um, you, you want to target the institutions that reach a lot of people. So one of the things you can do is work with the microfinance sector in, in countries even fragile states often have microfinance sectors of some kind, commercial or non-commercial. They reach a lot of people at the, at the base of the pyramid. And so you could imagine some kind of innovative ways of using institutions like that, some sort of um, government support or some sort of international support for debt relief for microfinance clients, for example, that would get um, that would get relief to a lot of people quickly. That's certainly something that, for example, in the Haiti um, uh, earthquake, the microfinance sector was a key way to get 
um, relief out to a lot of people at the same time. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Nancy. Our colleague, Charles Kenny, following up on some of the earlier conversation asked, uh, alongside general economic support is now the moment to guarantee pledges to the Gavi Alliance and or other agencies good at procuring equipment in bulk so that we know there is say 20 billion to purchase COVID vaccines for the lowest income countries as soon as they become available. Obviously we've mentioned that there's a replenishment but that replenishment is based on the old number of low income countries. We might see countries slip from middle income in back into low income status. That's one possible thing that could happen. Um, and then we also need them to purchase uh, the vaccine in bulk. So how would you think about that? It is a different order of magnitude of financing and, and we haven't really talked about that. Scott, Masood? I, th I think that, Amanda, I think that's a question that you should answer for, your, for yourself. I was going to say, you're the best place to, to answer yeah. it. Uh, and can I add a follow-up question to, to you, Amanda, which is, um, uh, okay, you know, I think, I think, you know, we finally maybe come around in, a, in our own country to understanding that the health crisis uh, is, is the economic crisis in a sense. I mean, you know, that you have to address it definitively and first. But you know, for low-income countries, uh, you know, how are we, how are we to think about that? And you know, and, and even for the MDBs and and this sort of constellation of health funds and actors, how much do they should they be sort of pushed to the forefront? That you know, really, it's about whatever COVID response can look like in in those countries, and and recognizing that's even a more challenging um, task. Yeah, I think we'll be uh, scheduling a follow-up uh, session to discuss some of those issues. Um, but we we certainly can see that um, the resourcing that we are currently providing is insufficient to be able to uh, secure a vaccine for Ida countries. And and as you're saying, you know, not, the high-income countries aren't going to be done with this outbreak until all countries are done with this outbreak. So we really do need to address. Uh, these issues everywhere in the world um, as much as we can, and it's not particularly expensive. And then the other thing we need to think about is what are the kinds of structures uh, and architecture for global health that we need going forward to prevent something like this happening again? Um, we'll, we'll do another event, Charles, but thanks for your question. There is a last question uh, related, and then we'll, then we'll wrap up. Um, a question about uh, what would be the effects of extending uh, repayment, debt repayment um, uh, terms, uh, whether it's the IFIs or others. Would it affect credit ratings? Are we creating a space where Volter funds would come in? I think what I heard Brad say is now's not the time to deal with that problem. We'll deal with that in the future. But can you give us your sort of Last take home uh, comments based on our conversation so far. We'll start with Brad. Well, look, uh, I think as Masood has mentioned, right now the world is looking for relatively safe assets. Even if the MDBs take some balance sheet risk, their structure, the backing of the world's governments, will make them a safe asset. They will continue to be a safe asset, even with some riskier exposures, so long as they are backed by the collective strength of all the major economies around the world. So I don't think we need to worry too much about the risk that the IMF and the World Bank are taking. Similarly, countries, bilateral creditors that extend the maturity on their loans they should hold those loans on their own balance sheets. They shouldn't sell them to third parties. And that way, enforcement remains in the hands of governments, not in the hands of aggressive creditors. Third point here is that there will be some defaults on private bonds. There will be cases when it would be in the interest of the current holders of those bonds to reach agreement quickly with the, their creditors to extend repayment voluntarily, to cure the default, and that would address the risk of vulture litigation. But I would also note that right now, 
our courts should not be rushing to enforce claims against sovereigns in distress. There have been changes that have been made that should slow the rush to the courthouse. The pure, the simple fact that it is so hard to meet in person uh, should slow the rush. And I think the U.S. Treasury should be pretty clear in filing briefs to the courts saying that now is not the time to support innovative strategies for collection on defaulted claims. Combine those measures and I think we can manage these risks. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Scott? Yeah, the, uh, the, the only thing I wanted to add is that I would take Brad's second point and put that language directly in a G20 leader statement. It's exactly the kind of commitment uh, that is specific and meaningful. So uh, we commit uh, to extend, you know, restructure our bilateral credits and to hold them on our books. They can do, the, you know, if the G20 does that, um, yes, there will be other bilateral creditors out there, but you've captured the vast majority of, of those credits and it would be a meaningful commitment. So I, I, I think that would be great to see. Matt, can I just final, say one, one final point? Um, look, we're in the middle of a global uh, crisis, and uh, you know, this, it's always tempting to say, well, what's, what's the silver lining? Is there is there something you can see, something good that could come out of this crisis? And uh, you know, it's a little trite right now to be, to be saying something good will necessarily come out of it. But it is a stark reminder of if we needed one, of how much our world is interconnected in ways that we hadn't anticipated and in ways for which we hadn't set up the structures to manage them. In November of 2017, Larry Summers, who's the chair of the board of, of CGT, spoke at our annual uh, event. And I remember vividly an analogy he used, which was to say that the WHO budget for pandemic flu was somewhat less than the annual salary of the Michigan State football coach. And you know, you sort of look back on it today and, and you see that some what we are now paying is the gross underinvestment in a system to support and manage global public goods and global public bads. And if there's one lesson that we learned from this exercise is that going forward, we have to uh, invest in the, the ways in which these global uh, effects can be better managed than we've been able to do. And in doing that, we have to recognize that whatever the bilateral relationships between countries, you know, whatever the relationship is between the United States and China, for example, going forward, the only way we can manage common problems like pandemics, like climate, is by finding ways to work in a common framework to deal with them. So I guess that, that's a conversation we're going to have down the road. But I do want to say that this is a stark reminder of the degree to which we've become interdependent and the, and the extent to which we need to manage that. Great. Well, I think uh, unless others have uh, final words to add, that seems like a good place to end this session with thanks to all of you online for joining us and to promise that our audio will be better in the next round. Um, and really to thank very much the panelists and especially Brad um, who joined us. Your clarity is uh, hugely appreciated, um, and you can read more of Brad's stuff uh, on his site over at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, but thanks to everyone, and we'll be having some more soon also from the perspective of the health sector. So thanks very much for joining, and stay healthy. Bye.